Welcome to Great Comedic Minds by Kara Robertson, a podcast where we meet some of the greatest comedic creators of our time and find out their real stories. From your favorite TV shows, movies, and live stand-up, we interview the storytellers and joke writers who have entertained us for years to find out exactly how and why they do it. And now, here's your host, Kara Robertson. I'm here with Mike Scully, who is a US-based TV writer and producer. He grew up in West Springfield, Massachusetts, and has won three Primetime Emmy Awards and a Lifetime Achievement Award by the WGA West in 2010. He worked as a writer, executive producer, and showrunner for The Simpsons, writer for Parks and Recreation, and co-creator of the hit animated TV show Duncanville, along with his wife, Julie Facker, and Amy Pohl. Mike Coke also co-wrote The Simpsons movie. Um, was it your wedding anniversary yesterday? Uh, yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> Happy yeah. anniversary. I heard the, uh, the Simpsons gag on the garage doors that date. Is that right? Oh yes, it's a uh, it's a joke where Homer painted. He was supposed to be painting the garage, and it's where he left off, uh, and and never finished it. So yeah, it says uh, I might say like start here seven seventeen ninety five or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, that that's our wedding day. Oh, that's that's really cool. So Massachusetts, what was that like? What was it like growing up there? Oh, God, it It was a a great childhood, Um, you know, a lot of fun. It's not the, it's, you know, I grew up in West Springfield, Mass, uh, no connection to the Simpsons Springfield. Uh, But yeah, it was, uh, you know, we had seasons, we had different kinds of weather and (laughs) all the things we don't have in LA, rain. So it was cold. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, we had very cold winters and play hockey outside on frozen ponds and uh, all that. So yeah, it was a great childhood of uh, playing outside and and uh, and then watching endless hours of TV that uh, affected me even deeper than I realized. You were voted in high school most likely not to live up to your potential. Is that right? <laughs> well, that's a joke title, but uh, that that you know. Whenever I would get in any kind of trouble at school, it's funny, I was just talking about this with uh, one of my daughters. Uh, yeah, th- th- I was always a lot about not living up to my potential or squandered potential. If the teacher had to write a comment on my grades uh, to my parents, uh, usually the word potential was there. <laughs> would you say it was true? Did you live oh, up yeah. to it? <laughs> yeah. Totally. Could, yes, could you have yeah. been the guy you were going to cure cancer, but then you ended up going uh, to be a TV writer instead? Oh, uh, absolutely. I I was from like to the time, uh, let's see, elementary school and like middle school till I was about 13. I was like, like straight A student you know, and uh, just on this driven path. And then suddenly like in eighth grade, I, I started like getting big laughs uh and for some reason i decided okay i'm going to be class clown instead like i didn't realize you could do both you could be funny and still accomplish <laughs> something important for mankind like to me it, for some reason i decided it, it could only be one or the other so i i i chose being funny <laughs> okay and you um you've done some early in the early days to learn how to uh, structure a joke you did stand up is that when I moved to LA, I, I, I left Massachusetts in 1982 and moved to, to LA and started doing like open mic nights and that sort of thing, uh, stand up. And uh, yeah, you learn very quickly. And I believe you're a stand up, right? Yeah. 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 So, uh, you know, you learn very quickly. Like when you write a joke, you know, on a piece of paper, so it may not look that long, but when you get up and say it in front of a group of people, suddenly it's interminable. Like, just get to the joke, get to the joke. So I learned very quickly how to streamline jokes, get rid of the unnecessary words, even the unnecessary syllables. Uh, and, and, and that is, you know, hugely important in TV comedy writing because you're dealing in time constraints and like that. So you learn to write very fast, punchier jokes. Uh, so I learned a lot from, from doing stand-up. Okay. And um, you started writing scripts and you were working in a few different jobs. 
Um, how did you get your first job in TV? Uh, the first job in TV, I had, I had been selling jokes and, and writing jokes for a Russian comedian named Yakov Smirnov, who uh, at the time he was just starting to become very successful in the United States. And then he was offered a TV series, uh, which was called What a Country, which was the tagline of his act. Uh, and so uh, because I was writing for him already at the time when he got the TV series, he wanted to have me on staff because I was very familiar with his uh, comedic voice. Uh, it, it made him feel more comfortable and it was a great opportunity for me. So that wound up being my first staff job, but I had already been trying. I was writing sample scripts and sending them out around town, getting rejections um, and you know things like that. So TV writing, after doing open mics for a, few, a couple of years out here, I was trying to figure out what do I really want to do in comedy? And writing was always more enjoyable to me. And uh, you know, the idea of kind of going on the road and all that, it wasn't, I don't think I was really wired for that. So uh, I got on the writing path and then I just got lucky that Yakov happened to get a show. The show only lasted one season, but it, it kind of got my foot in the door on TV writing. Okay. Um, yeah. Was it 93, um, you were hired by The Simpsons? Uh, yeah, for like, from like 86 to 93, I kind of like drifted from, bad show to bad show to bad show. <laughs> um, but you learn a lot. Even if you're working on a show that doesn't turn out great, you still learn a lot. And I was working with a lot of good people, a lot of really funny writers. And, uh, you know, because at any given time, there's only a handful of like great shows on TV. And and the rest is kind of a, a mix of, you know, various levels of quality or, or shows that start out strong, but then don't turn into what everyone's hoping. Uh, but yeah, in 1993, I got a very lucky break where somebody from Gracie Films, who produces The Simpsons, had read a, a couple of my sample scripts. There was a, a spec uh, Seinfeld script and a Larry Sanders show script. And based on those, I got called in for a meeting and then it wound up turning into a job offer and, um, you know, turned into like a 28 year job. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> You replaced Conan O'Brien. Was there a lot of pressure to like follow in his footsteps? Was he big <laughs> at the time? Was he known as the way he's, he's obviously known now? But the yeah, time. well, I I didn't like really replace him. It wound up where I got the the job, and my first day there, he was on the staff, and but he had already done his audition show for the late night spot. I think they were deciding between like Conan and Jon Stewart and somebody, I think they had, and so Conan had done like a test show for the network, but he was considered the long shot to get the job because nobody knew who he was at that time. So my first day there, we had just met, we just literally had shaken hands and, uh, and he, somebody came in and told him he had a phone call. And he went and took the call and then he never came back to the writer's room that day. And we were starting to get a little worried. <laughs> and what had happened was NBC told him, you're going to be our new late night host, but you can't tell anybody and we don't want you talking to anyone. So go home and just stay there until we officially announce it. So he just disappeared. Uh, so uh so then, you know, I wound up, so we never really got to work together outside of that handshake, <laughs> which was sad because he was, he wasn't known to the public, but he was kind of legendary among writers. So you would hear stories about this hilarious guy at the Simpsons who would perform in the character voices and, you know, he would stand on the table while doing, you know, bits and stuff like that. So I was really looking forward to it and we never got to work together. You wrote 12 episodes? The some notable ones are the um, Team Homer, which is the bowling team. Uh, March Not Be Proud, uh, which is where Bart gets caught shoplifting. Was that that was based on something that really happened, right? Yes. When I was uh, 13 years old, uh, I was in a store in my hometown, and there were some other kids in there, not unlike the you know the bullies on The Simpsons, like Nelson and Jimbo, <laughs> and they kind of pressured me to 
because they were like filling their pockets with stuff. <laughs> and uh, so I felt like, well, to be cool, I thought, all right, I'll do it. So I grabbed like a little 45 record shelf and jammed it inside my coat. And we got outside the store and they all got away no problem. And then suddenly like there was a hand on my shoulder pulling me back <laughs> to the store. And I was the one who got busted. Yeah. <laughs> Was it um, fun to write about? Or was that hard to write about when you're talking about your real life? Oh, no, it was a lot of fun to write about because it already had like a great, it was a great kid's story. Like Bart was the type of kid that could have been, you know, caught shoplifting. And then that fear of your parents finding out and then those fears playing out, you know, like when they do, you know, that sort of thing. The great example for, for, um, from a writing perspective, I learned was just because something happens to you in real life, you don't have to tell the story exactly as it happened. You can use it as a jumping off point and then maybe go a more interesting way. Like in my real, what happened to me when I was a kid, my parents didn't find out. Uh, but for the story, it was more interesting that they did find out and how it affects Marge, that she feels I've lost my little boy, you know, uh, and that, and, and then how, like, what a gut punch it is, you know, for Bart, because that was my biggest fear. Like, my dad finding out, I knew he would just like scream at me and <laughs> tell me, you know, <laughs> and ground me for a month. And that. But my mom finding out, I knew it would have been devastating to her, which would have been devastating to me. So we played it out like a what if story. Like, what if she, you know, what if my mom had found out? <laughs> The disappointed mum, yeah, <laughs> being uh, yeah. <laughs> heartbreaking. Yeah. Um, you wrote Lisa on ice. You've written a lot of uh, Lisa-centric episodes. Um, why do you think that is? I kind of gravitate to Lisa. First of all, I have five daughters. Okay. Uh, so I have all daughters. And uh, so I'm like father daughter stories. I'm kind of a sucker for them. <laughs> uh, and that one was a, a fun combination of being able to use Lisa because she's such a great character, but put her in a setting that was unfamiliar to her, which is athletic competition as opposed to academic. Uh, I grew up being a big hockey fan uh, in my town. We had a, a minor league hockey team in my town and I played hockey. So putting Lisa in that setting uh, was just a lot of, it was just a fun, I, I think it worked better. And it was fun because Lisa is a competitive character when it comes to academics. And then she discovers that competitive side of her carries over into sports also, like that she was a pretty aggressive, violent player. And uh, yeah, so it was, it was a fun, and we got to kind of take on like sports dads in America. I don't know how it is in Australia, but little league like sports dads can get pretty aggressive over here where they, they wind up fighting each other in the stands, watching their kids' games. <laughs> so we thought, oh well, Homer could be the you know the the typical American sports dad, uh, and, and so there was a lot of fun to to play with on the show. Plus, the show had already done a baseball episode at that point, um, and a football one. <laughs> so we were kind of exploring what sports haven't we done yet. You were obviously the executive producer and producer as well after that. Um, I read a lot about when I was researching that uh, your team very much liked you. So do you have advice when you're leading a writing team for people? Yeah, well, for, there was the weird thing was, I mean, I, I mean, I would, first of all, I was scared to death to, you know, to take on that job. I mean, the, the show is the most, you know, successful, you know, successful show in the history of television. And now I'm in charge of it. But also, I didn't go to college. I went to like one day of what they we call community college here, which is basically like just a notch above high school. It's not really college. <laughs> and I only went for one day and I quit. But the Simpsons writing staff is extremely educated and intellectual. They're all Harvard graduates. So I found myself the first day sitting, you know, in, in charge, you know, I, you know, of all these Harvard grads, and I'm kind of the village idiot of the group. Uh, so I just didn't, you know, want to mess up. I didn't want to sink, <laughs> sink the show or ruin it. Uh, but also, you work with these, you know, I had worked with these people for four years already on the staff. So you know, to like, 
to respect what they have to say, you know, that everybody there is extremely valuable and smart and funny. And you kind of, you know, learn to, you know, you, you've always thought they were funny before. When you become the boss, you shouldn't stop listening to the, to those people because a lot of them were the people that got the show to where it was. So I just kind of go by the room. If, to me, if, there, if somebody pitches a joke and there's, you know, 16 people in a room laughing at a joke that maybe I don't get or I don't think is funny, I'm going to defer to those 16 people and say, let's give it a shot because there's a good chance that you, you are, you're all, you're all correct. And I'm, I'm wrong. <laughs> so, uh, and sometimes I would put in jokes that I literally didn't understand because the joke was so intellectual. I would have no idea what it was. It, they would be like, cause you know, the room was made up of uh, there's, you know, a biochemist, several math geniuses, uh, so uh, I, I would trust their instincts uh, and, and go with the joke and give it a try. And then if it doesn't work later, you can always change it. What was your favorite episode? Oh, gosh. Um, oh, man, there's so many to choose from. I mean, I'm a, I am a huge sucker for the Lisa episodes, like the, uh, the vegetarian one. But I also love like Bart Sells His Soul is one of my favorites. Uh, that's written by Greg Daniels, who uh, created the American version of The, of the Office. Um, that's a fun one. The, the first one I ever watched and that got me hooked on the show was um, Bart the Daredevil, where he's going to skateboard over Springfield Gorge and Homer winds up accidentally doing it instead. That whole sequence where Homer goes over the gorge first scared, then exhilarated because he thinks he's going to make it. And he says, I'm king of the world. <laughs> and then he falls just short of the other side of the gorge. And that whole sequence of jokes of where they're trying to rescue him and banging his head all the way up. Then they put him in the ambulance. Ambulance drives immediately into a tree and he goes back out the back door again and falls a second time. It's still to this day, one of the I don't think I've ever laughed harder at a sequence in a TV show than than that particular sequence. So those are all favorites. The rock and roll fantasy camp was fun for other reasons, uh, just because we got to, you know, hang out with uh, Mick Jagger and Keith Richards and Tom Petty. <laughs> yeah. well, that been very good. Is any any um, stories from that? Did you go out afterwards or? Okay. No, we did not go out okay. afterwards, but... Uh, um let's see i mean you know you know mick jagger was you know hilarious and, and you know i i at one point he called like the person traveling with him said mick would like to see you in the green room there's like a waiting room area where we have food and stuff like that for guests of the show so i went in figuring there would be like an entourage of people with him uh, and I, so I walked in and he's in there just by himself, uh, sitting on the couch with the script open. And so I introduced myself and he goes, Oh, he like pats the couch, like, Oh, have a seat. Like, so I sat down next to him and I'm trying to be the professional, you know, executive producer of the show, but inside it's like, 12 year old me is just kind of going, oh my God, oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> and we went through the script and he pointed out jokes that he liked. We, we tweaked a couple uh, lines to like, to he had a wording that was better for something. And so that was a big kick, but they were all, you know, they were all a lot of fun. Tom Petty was delightful. Keith was a blast, uh, Elvis Costello. Uh, it was just, you know, that's part of the, the fun of The Simpsons is on any given day, you never know who's coming in to record. <laughs> you worked for Everybody Loves Raymond. How did that come about? Um, I had met the creator of the show, Phil Rosenthal, and we had become friendly. And it was after I had stopped, I was no longer running The Simpsons. And he had called, he had an opening on his staff it was like season seven of that show. And he asked if I would be interested in doing it. And, and I said, oh, absolutely. I was a huge fan of the show. Just my wife and I loved watching it together. Um, and uh, so he, he had a, 
I think, but he told me that actually the network, he had mentioned my name to the network and they had kind of shot it down saying, oh, he's a cartoon guy. Um, and I had never heard that. I mean, you hear of actors being typecast into like certain kinds of roles, but I had never heard of that for a writer, like that they do a certain kind of comedy. And apparently I was cartoon boy, which I didn't realize. <laughs> and so that kind of made me like really want the job even more. Um, so Phil, you know, had to kind of go to bat for me. And I think he just wanted to make sure first that I really wanted the job. Uh, but it kind of scared me like that you realize, oh, I'm around town. That's how I'm known. So I'm only going to be able to get jobs on animated shows from now on. So I made it a point from that point, like moving forward to always kind of keep a toe in at the Simpsons and do animation. But I, you know, did Raymond and, and Parks and Rec and I, I made it a very, uh, it became important for me to continue doing live action too. The transition like, because obviously writing animated um, people and writing real people would be different. Yeah, so <laughs> you, yeah, I, I always said like on Raymond, yeah, there's things you can do in animation because the fact that it's animated puts up a little, a slight barrier like from reality that like, you know, with Homer strangling Bart, you can laugh at it, and, you know, and Bart gasping for air and stuff. But like, if Raymond had done that to his kids on the show, it would just be horrifying to watch. <laughs> so, be canceled, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you learn, you know, and, you know, it's a different part of your brain, I think, the, the cartoon part. Um, but this, you know, the basics are still the same. Um, you're still writing a story. You want it to have good conflict. Uh, you'd like it to have some uh, emotion uh, in there. And, uh, you know, and then the, the style of jokes that you can do in animation sometimes are different. You can go inside a character's head and do fantasy scenes and dream sequences and flashbacks and that kind of stuff that in live action, you don't really go to those areas. You can defy gravity in animation. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. You created a number of shows, so including Duncanville, the uh, latest one. What's it like to create a show? Uh, it's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we, we, we've done it a number of times. My wife, Julie, and I have created several together. And, um, you know, the, the odds of success are incredibly slim uh, of that you're going to break through and every, everything is going to click into place. You know, 90% of TV shows fail. Um, so, you know, I, we've tried like over the year, like after the first time a show was canceled that we created, we said, all right, we're never getting emotionally attached to a show again. We're going to keep a, a professional distance. So when they when they cancel us, it won't hurt as much. <laughs> uh, but inevitably, you wind up getting very attached because you have to you have to care that much about it because of all the work that's involved. You know, it's it's a lot of hours, a lot of late nights, um, a lot of you know trial and error of things you thought would work that don't. And but it's also like fun surprises when you find something that does work or something that you didn't expect would work. You know, suddenly does so. It's, yeah, it is very hard. And now, especially, I mean, there's so many shows on with the streaming services. You can have a show on for several seasons and some people have never heard of it uh, just because people are, no one's watching the same show at the same time. Everybody's watching something different. Uh, and, you know, the shows don't stick around like they used to, you know, like, the Simpsons now is on right now. They're reading scripts for season 34. You, you're never going to see a show do this again. Like if you can keep a show on the air for like five seasons now, that's a huge victory. You know, if you look at like Netflix and they cancel shows after 39 episodes, maybe, you know, 50 episodes, if you're really lucky, the idea of doing, even a hundred episodes now, let alone like 700, but even doing a hundred episodes now seems like impossible that I don't think the streamers have the patience to, I don't think there'll ever be another 
Friends or a Seinfeld or Cheers or the, you know those shows uh, or The Office, uh, they, they just don't seem to be in that business of bringing a show back year after year and where audiences like really fall in love with the characters um, and you get to see them evolve over you know all those seasons uh, I, I think those days seem to be gone I would like to see it come back but I don't know <laughs> I wonder if that's because we binge them now so we'll watch a show for 10 hours and then get sick of it after 10 hours straight yeah, straight. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the most popular shows on the streamers are still it's it is like the office okay. and yeah. and Seinfeld and Friends because there's so many episodes to pick from, you can kind of jump in wherever you want and uh, watch it for a while and not get sick of it. But I I don't picture myself going back and rewatching these shows that only have twenty or thirty episodes. I I don't think I'll do it. It's like yeah, I already saw it. I I'll just get sick of it too quickly. <laughs> Okay, yeah, that's probably true. You also get probably comfort watching shows we're familiar with. Um, oh, totally, yeah. totally. Or, or you forget certain episodes. E even if you love the series, you might forget certain episodes and then suddenly they pop up. Uh, but now, you know, like the binging, and it's all over so quickly too. Like a show comes on, every, you know, they try and get everybody to watch it that first weekend and then it's over for like another, like a year or two before they might bring it back again. <laughs> so. Okay. I still, when I watch The Simpsons, I still see jokes that I didn't get from watching. I might have watched an episode a hundred times and I'll watch it now. Um, I think growing with a series is also something that we do. Yeah, I think uh, on a show like The Simpsons, yeah, because we always wrote the show for adults, meaning not necessarily that it, like the jokes were dirty, but it was just written for you know an older audience, but we were always aware that kids were watching. Okay. Uh, and I think like there was shows like that when I was a kid, like the Rocky and Bullwinkle show. I can see one now and like, oh, the writers were putting in jokes that I never would have gotten as a kid. <laughs> uh, stuff that was just funny to them. You know? uh, and you know, so we, we do try to do that on The Simpsons. We try not to write down to the audience. Okay. It, it's more fun for us, like you're saying, like you watch an episode when you're a kid, then you watch it again as an adult and you suddenly see things you didn't see the first time. <laughs> What's your number one bit of advice for someone who wants to get into, so they're just starting out in TV writing? Oh God. Uh, well, I, I guess if it's comedy, I mean, it's changed a lot since I broke in. There are other ways to break in. Eventually you have to write. Yeah, first of all, start writing. You got to write scripts, you know, sample scripts. Um, people tend to want to read, like when I was breaking in, they wanted to, you to write a sample script of an existing series and to come up with a story for that series and then write your own version of it to see if you could make it sound like the characters in that show and, uh, and get the tone of the show. Now they tend to want to read original material, like your own pilot for a series, which personally I think is crazy, but it, you know, that's the way the business has shifted now. So I, you know, I would say write at least one original material, a, a script, and then maybe write one example of writing an episode of another series that you enjoy. Uh, also take advantage of places like Twitter, uh, where some writers are being discovered now just for writing funny jokes on Twitter. Um, because you can't teach somebody to be funny. You can teach them about story and structure and character, but you can't teach somebody to be funny. They, they either are or they aren't. You know? So uh, Twitter is a great uh, place now where people are being discovered. People are putting up all sorts of like short you know, videos on you know, YouTube and TikTok. And there's, there's places where people are getting discovered that didn't exist when I was breaking in. So go to where you think your strengths are. Yeah. What's it like working with your wife? Oh, it's a blast. Uh, yeah. It's kind of, it's, it's fun. And it's amazing. Like how many times, like you can't solve like a problem, like for an episode, maybe in, in the room that day, you were there for hours and you couldn't figure it out. But then later like that night where 
you're in the car or, or something and then suddenly it hits you like and you can solve it uh plus it's a kind of nice to like share the stress <laughs> of the job uh with someone who gets it and understands you know the pressure uh, of that and 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 to bounce things off of each other we make each other laugh so that's uh you know yeah. that helps a lot <laughs> what do your kids think of it as they got older, um, you know, they get, they would start to catch on a little bit that sometimes we would take something they would say or do, and it would wind up in an episode. <laughs> uh, so they became a little more like suspicious of, hey, that, that's not going to wind up in a show, is it? <laughs> uh, that sort of stuff. But no, they've enjoyed it. And uh, it, it's uh, it's been fun, I think, for them, for the most part. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Everyone was particularly excited about um, me having you as a guest. So, um, oh. yeah, really appreciate um, you coming on the show. Absolutely. My pleasure. Uh, I haven't been to Australia in many years. It's been about 20 years since I was over there, but we had such a great time. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, oh, it was terrific. The, the, the people were so nice. And I had never had ice cream on pancakes before. So, really? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Where did you go in Australia? Yeah, Australia has always been. Oh, we went to uh, Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, I'm trying. I feel like somewhere else. Cairn. Am Cairns? I saying it right? Yeah, Cairns. Cairns? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, we had a great time. Australia has always been uh, wonderful to the Simpsons too. Um, it's Love it. Um, yeah, long after American audiences were taking the show for granted, Australia was always extra nice to us. <laughs> well, if you ever come to Brisbane, let me know. That's what I'm All right, cool. Well, it's great talking to you, and, uh, and best of luck to you, too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us on a great episode of Great Comedic Minds. We'll be back next week, so be sure to tune in. Also, like, share, subscribe to the channel, and be sure to follow Carl Robertson on Instagram.